Hi, everyone. This is lecture two of experimental nuclear astrophysics lectures for uh, Nuclei in the Cosmos 2021. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so after lecture one, this is roughly where we stopped. If you remember, we talked about an overview of the astrophysical processes for heavy element nucleosynthesis. Um, what are the nuclear physics needs for each of these processes and how we go about measuring and connecting what we measure to the astrophysical environment. And we also introduce some of the um, uh, accelerator facilities and how we would produce the beams we need for these measurements. So move, moving on to what it, how we do these measurements. And I showed this slide already saying that the cross section, uh, in order to measure the cross section, we need to know basically three things, the number of target particles, the number of beam particles, and the number of reactions that happen. So I'll go through different examples of these. Of course, there are special cases, and so I won't cover everything, but kind of the general idea of how you measure these things. A classic way of measuring uh, the number of target particles is through Rutherford backscattering. This can be done with a source, but usually we use accelerators uh, to do that. So you would produce, you would use a beam, let's say of alpha particles um, and that beam, and what we're interested in is measuring the thickness of this target, this delta E. And so what we would do is shoot the beam straight at the target. It could interact right here and then backscatter and come back. And this is where our detector is located or the beam could lose some energy as it goes through the material of our target and it could interact anywhere in the target and also all the way at the end, uh, the back end. And then coming back, these particles would also lose energy going through the target. So there's two sections of losing energy and then they go all the way back and again, hitting our detector. So in a picture like this, the, the interaction that's happening right here in the beginning of the target would give a lot of energy. And so it would show up in a spectrum as the high end. And the particles that go all the way through the target, losing energy and then coming back and losing more energy, they would be at a lower energy. And so it would go like this. There's a little bit of a slope to this because it just is a higher probability to, um, to go through uh, with the low energies. So this is kind of the, the theoretical thing. This is what are the real thing looks like. This is analyzing a MOLE 92 target. The, and uh, on top of this, we have a simulation with a program called Seaman Array. It's a nice program that is available that has all the cross sections for this Rutherford backscattering. And you put the material in and it knows exactly what's going on. Um, and so you just put in the energy of your beam, the type, in this case, it was deuterons. And then you, the, the main uncertain, uncertainty or free parameter in your problem is the width of your target. This particular target was sitting on, on aluminum backing. And so you can also see the aluminum distribution going all the way to the end because the beam just stops in this aluminum. So this is one way to measure this uh, target thickness. Um, the uh, one question to think about, uh, we're gonna discuss is what would it happen if my backing was not aluminum like this case, but it was actually tantalum. The tantalum is a common backing because it, it produces low background. Uh, but in this case, if it was tantalum, I'll let you think about it and we can discuss uh, asking the question if you cannot figure it out. Okay, another way to figure out the number of target particles is to get the material, your target and go through X-ray fluorescence or fluorescence or XRF. So the idea here is that you should uh, array um, a beam of X-rays onto your material. It will excite and kick out some of the electrons, excite the, the nuclear, the atom, sorry. And when that atom de-excites to fill the hole that was formed with this uh, electron, then it emits characteristic X-rays that belong to this material. And so we ag again know the cross sections for all of these processes. And based on this, we can just fit this, um, uh, these distributions, these X-rays and figure out in this particular case, we had palladium uh, together with some uh, copper. Uh, the easiest probably way to measure the target thickness, but, but probably the least accurate is uh, just using an alpha source. 
that's a classic. You just get an alpha source. Everyone has an alpha source in their lab. You need vacuum for, uh, for this. You cannot just do it in air, but you get the alpha source and you shoot it at a detector. And you can just do this with nothing in between and you, you just measure the, um, the alpha spectrum. This would look something like the blue line here. And then you put the target that you want to measure the thickness of uh, intercepting the beam. And then we will see that that peak will shift down because now you have energy loss and will also get wider because you also have energy struggling. So this kind of thing, again, from this distance, you can figure out the target thickness, but it tends to be less accurate than the other measurements just because of this energy struggling that we have. But it's the easiest. There are many other techniques. You can use resonances, you can use a spectrometer or a recoil separator, you can use a reaction. There are many, many other techniques that you can do that. And another uh, one that is important to know is that if your sample is radioactive, then just by measuring the activity of the sample, you can, uh, you can figure out the target particles. Switching now to the number of beam particles, if you have a high beam intensity, then the, the classic way of measuring the, the number of beam particles is just by measuring the current. So you would just, you know, you get your beam through, let's say it hits the target. If you attach an ammeter uh, or a current integrator onto your target, then you can measure the amount of charge deposited uh, as a function of time. You integrate that and then you figure out how many beam particles are there based on the charge deposited. Now here, this is important to know that if it's just a hydrogen beam, it's by default singly charged um, ions. So every, every beam particle will deposit the charge of the electron, 1.6 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. But if you have to deal with heavy beams, like um, in this example here, I have Krypton 84, which is in a 27 plus state, charge state, then this beam, each beam particle doesn't deposit uh, one electron charge, but it deposits 27 times that. So just measuring the, with the ammeter is not enough. We need to know our charge state and then correct for it or take that into account. There are, I want to mention here that there are issues with the, this technique, uh, like electrons flying out of your target uh, that you lose. And so you have an inaccurate measurement. You have electrons flying out of your collimators that could make it into your target and again, measure inc incorrectly. We can discuss all of these in our discussion if you want. I didn't want to go into too much detail here. If we have a low beam intensity, like with radioactive beams, for example, then you kind of have to do these measurements with um, uh, particle detectors. So one way is to have an in-beam detector upstream from your target, like here, um, and you can just measure continuously. As long as this doesn't disrupt your beam, uh, you can just measure continuously. You could also, if this is going to hurt your beam or destroy your beam, then you can also just put this detector every whatever, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, depending on how you think, how stable you think is your beam. And again, do these measurements every once in a while. And this could be many different kinds of detectors. It could be silicon, plastic scintillators, MCP detectors, seen diamond detectors, fusion detectors. There are so many different types of detectors that could be. And depending on the situation and the beam, you can choose. Um, you could have uh, scattering detectors. So you have just a very thin foil that intercepts your beam and you put some silicon detectors. And so you just measure the scattering depending on what kind of beam you have, it could scatter backwards or it could scatter forward. Um, so we can just measure the scattering. You could have detectors surrounding your target and then this, uh, then you don't have to put anything else in your beam. You just measure the scattering directly coming out of your target. This assumes that you have enough space to do that, but this is also a good option. You could also have a detector downstream from your target and uh, measure with that. Um, again, assuming that the beam does go through the target and that that's convenient. And you could also do activation, especially when we're dealing with neutrons. That would be that oops, either with your target, the target itself, or you put a foil upstream or downstream from your target. And then you just see how much well, you look at the cross section, basically, and you look at that activation. 
Okay, so that's briefly how we deal with tar uh, number of target particles and number of beam particles. Uh, but usually the majority of our effort goes into measuring the reactions. And I showed this picture uh, in the pre uh, previous lecture saying that we could measure this direct gamma rays. We could measure the charge, the charge particles or neutrons coming out if that's the reaction we're interested in. But you can also measure the beta delayed uh, products like the beta delayed gamma rays. This part would be called activation. Um, there, you can also measure x-rays. You could forget about all the products that are coming out in inverse kinematics, especially, and you just measure the recoil in nuclei. Uh, and you can just do a combination of the above just to make sure that everything you're measuring is accurate. Uh, it, a very important thing when you do all of these things is that you need to know the efficiency of your detectors. That's geometric efficiency and intrinsic efficiency. We need to understand the setup, make sure we know where the backgrounds are coming from and to remove those, subtract them, or just measure them. Um, and then of course, figure out what the uncertainties are. Okay, so we, decided, um, we separate our experiments into two types. We have regular kinematics and inverse kinematics. Regular kinematics, just the kind of more traditional way where we have a heavy nucleus sitting here, and then we have a light beam hitting that nucleus, and we measure the, the products that are coming out. I show here a whole list of you know, facilities and techniques that use these regular kinematics, uh, but this is just the classic every, everywhere, uh, in, at least in the past, this was the, the technique used. Uh, the disadvantage of this the technique and why we even needed to invent the inverse kinematics is that it is not applicable for all targets. So if our target is um, something, some material that it's hard to make, or if it's radioactive, um, then we cannot use that as a target. And so we had to develop the, um, the inverse kinematics. And also sometimes measuring in inverse kinematics might give you better sensitivity. So... In terms of uh, the techniques, I'll show uh, just three, four, a few examples. Uh, one is activation. For the activation technique, really the idea is that you, you have the reaction happening somewhere where your beam is. You measure everything. There's an RBS here detector to monitor the target. There's a Faraday cup to measure the beam intensity. You just measure everything, but you're not really measuring the cross-section live in beam, as we call it. You just irradiate the target. And then after you turn off the beam, you grab this sample and you put it in front of some other detector, typically a high purity germanium detector, and you measure the activity coming out. This is a great and very sensitive technique. You don't have to deal with background coming from your beam. The problem is that the, the target, or sorry, the, the final nucleus that you're trying to measure has to have reasonable gamma rays that you can actually measure with your detector and also reasonable half-life. It cannot be, you know, uh, uh, 100 milliseconds and be able to transport this and put it in front of a detector. You could imagine a setup where the this detector is actually sitting right next to the setup and you kind of do beam on, beam off kind of thing. Uh, and people have done this in the past. But in general, this is these are the sensitivities. Uh, another option is to measure in beam um, and that you can do two things. You can measure the angular distribution. So this is a sample setup where you have four detectors at various angles and they're all sitting on a table that rotates. And so you can get many different angles and you need to have this angular distribution because that changes depending on which angle you're measuring, your cross section will be different depending on the multipolarity of the gamma ray. Uh, uh, transition. So this is another classic uh, experiment. And you, again, you measure the, the reaction you're interested in, you populate the nucleus at some entry state, and then you measure all the gamma rays coming out. Either you can measure the, the, the first gamma ray coming out of the entry state, uh, but those are typically not so well known. So typically we measure the last gamma ray feeding the ground state, which and those are much better known. You don't want to measure you know, twice, so you cannot measure this one and this one. You really want to either measure the ones leaving the entry state or the ones feeding the ground state. You don't want to measure uh, multiple times. 
Once you do that, then you end up with spectra that are pretty complex because there's a lot of gamma rays uh, involved in these uh, de excitations. And so you end, you end up with spectra that look like this. And for each single gamma ray that you want to take into account, you have to do uh, distributions, angular distributions like this. And then you grab the fits, uh, the fit of the angular distributions looks like this. And then you grab these fits and you put them into the cross section estimate. I, mean, I don't want to go to, into too much detail. My goal is not to have you memorize how exactly this is done. There are references for it, and I have a reference down here. Uh, but this is just to get an idea of that this thing uh, exists. And then finally, the other gamma ray based in beam technique is called the summing technique. Uh, my own work has focused a lot on this summing technique um, under various settings and different um, applications. The idea here is that, again, once you populate the entry state of the nucleus you're interested in, you're not trying to measure each individual gamma ray, but you have a large enough detector that will collect all of the gamma rays that are coming in coincidence. So like these three gamma rays are coming in coincidence, so you collect all of these. Or this guy, gamma one, would come together with gamma one zero. Once you do that, then your spectrum, instead of having a bunch of individual peaks, will have a single peak that corresponds to this energy. Doesn't matter how the de-excitation happens, it, uh, all that matters is the full energy that you have or you're populating. And so this is called the summing technique because you are summing all of the energy. And this makes your life a lot easier. You don't have to analyze every single gamma ray that we saw in the previous example. You can just analyze a single peak. Um, but it is more complicated than that, of course, because getting the efficiency of your detector under these conditions is a lot more complicated. And so it tends to be that all these techniques are complementary and you can choose which one fits the case best. Here's a sample spectrum of uh, the summing technique. Uh, there's a lot of background going on, but the, the peak, the sum peak will show up above all of the background and it's a nice clean peak and you can just integrate that and get your cross section. It's also a cool picture to see here how, um, because the, the energy of the entry state, so the energy of your sum peak depends on the beam energy. It's beam energy plus the Q value of the reaction. So as you change the beam energy, this peak should shift. So this is just one example. One example where we change the beam energy and you, we see a nice shift in our peak. You also see how it increases, uh, meaning that the cross section is increasing. Uh, so it's a pretty cool picture. So yeah, if I put everything together, the, the activation technique is definitely the most used one and is the simplest one. You just need a single detector uh, and that's it but it doesn't, you cannot apply it with every case. The angular distribution is probably the most complex, uh, but you can apply it to every single case. It's just that uh, it's more, it might be more complicated. You have to make sure you're not uh, losing any gamma rays or uh, missing them under the background and so on. And then the angle integrated measurements or summing measurements, this is also in beam to high efficiency. So it's nice and convenient, but you don't get any details because you need a, typically a large volume detector with not so good resolution. Okay, switching now to inverse kinematics. So here you have the heavy beam hitting a light target. Uh, the advantage here is that together with the, whatever reaction products or gamma rays that are coming out, you also have this heavy recoil. And this is great because you can do coincidences between the heavy recoil and the gamma rays, or you can just simply measure this heavy recoil. You have to be able to do a good job in uh, separating the heavy beam from the heavy recoil. Uh, so a lot of work is going into a separator. It's called a recoil separator to, to separate those two. And you have to do it in a very efficient way with, you know, like the beam could be 15 orders of magnitude stronger than the recoils that you're looking for. So you need to have 15 order of magnitude sensitivity and separate those two. And there are uh, techniques that can do that. Um, so I'm showing here some examples. You can do it with a recoil separator like this one. Um, people have done this uh, with the ring, the storage ring. We are trying to do the same thing at MSU using just the gamma rays. Uh, we have succeeded with stable beams and we're trying to apply this with radioactive beams. Uh, and this is an example at Ganil where we ha they have some kind of a separator, but not quite the whole recoil separator, but kind of a simpler setup. 
This is an example of just the more details on recoil separators. I don't want to go into too much uh, detail again for, I prefer that we have the discussion when, uh, when we meet live instead of spending too much time in the video. Um, but um, there are quite a few out there. I'm showing here the ones that I'm more familiar with in the, uh, in the US and Canada. Uh, so it's a dragon separator. It's out there for I think something like 10, 15 years. This uh, St. George at the University of Notre Dame is a newer Excel, um, separator, but it's at a stable beam facility and that's what it focuses on. And the newest addition is SECAR, which is uh, was right now commissioned at MSU. And this goes at a radioactive beam facility. And so you can see that everyone has some unique capabilities here. Um, the, the storage rings is a new, I think relatively new idea. Storage rings were built for other reasons. And I show some examples in the last lecture uh, for that we use storage rings. But in this case, they've used storage ring to measure P gamma reaction. They did the ruthenium 96 P gamma. And since then they did a couple more. Um, so the idea is that as the beam is going through the ring round and round, it will go something like a million times per second. And so if you have a beam of, let's say, one particle per second intensity, uh, but it goes around uh, a million times, it's like the equivalent of uh, one million particles per second beam. It's not quite that factor, but it's close. And so this is the advantage of using a storage ring for this kind of reactions. You're just enhancing your beam intensity by a lot. But to do that, you need to use a thin target, very thin target, so it doesn't disrupt your beam. And you have, of course, to have a, a way of measuring the recoils that are coming out. And this is what they've done at GSI and with uh, very nice results. Um, we are, oh yeah, this is the, the original reference and they've had a couple of new papers since. Uh, I mentioned that at MSU, we tried to do the same thing without a recoil separator, just measuring the gamma rays. This is a summing detector. Um, and we, we have succeeded a couple of times now. This is with aluminum 27. We also did a nickel 58 and a couple of krypton isotopes. And this has already uh, always been with stable beam so far and we're moving towards an unstable beam. Um, I think I'll stop here and get the indirect measurements in the, the next video. So uh, I'll see you in, the, in lecture three. <laughs>